All right, so good night, everyone, and welcome again to another episode of Innovatech. But as I said, right now we are focusing on just part of the program, which is financial literacy or <clears throat> understanding how to grow your money. Basically, trying to get all people to understand that if you're trying to build a business that works for you, you need to understand how the finances work. There are several parts about it. And of course, if you don't learn the parts, you end up with a good ideas. You end up doing a lot of good work. You might even end up having a lot of cash flow. But if you don't understand how it works, you actually end up losing it, right? There's a fable that says, you know, if you take all the wealth from all the people who have all the wealth, which is like the top 1% or top 5% of the people around the world who have all the wealth, and you take it and you give it to everyone else, within some years, within about a decade, the wealthy people will have the wealth back in their hands. And that's because there are some things that they know, there are some things that they have learned, and there are some principles by which they operate that allows them to accumulate wealth. Some through greed, but a lot of them through practical principles built into nature about resources, right? Most of them are like that. The people who are greedy really are really few of them. Very few, all right? But the people who practice the principles are a lot more, right? So what we're going to do is learn those principles so that when we get the cash flow coming to us, we know how to properly manage it, right? With some wisdom, okay? So we want to help our poor people to get rich and the rich to get wealthy, right? Of course, the people who are struggling, who are working for money, are actually considered the poor people and some of them middle class. Now, the thing is about it is that the difference is that there are some knowledge, some information that the different groups know that the others don't know. There's some beliefs that they have in their heart, you know, in their mind, that others don't know. And there's some habits they practice daily, right? So each of these groups knows things different, things that are Some of them have the same information, some of different information. But the two major things that their beliefs and their habits are different, right? Now, there are a lot of poor people who don't know what the rich people know or what the wealthy people know. Some of them do, some of them don't. But regardless of what happens, the belief system is different and therefore the habits are different. Okay? We want to understand the freedom, right, and the resources every one of us have. Those things that are common to all of us. It doesn't matter what class we live in, there are some things that everyone has. Just like everyone else, we have access to the sun, just like everyone else. We have access to 24 hours, just like everyone else. We have access to rain, just like everyone else. The weather patterns, whether it's storm, just like everyone else. <laughs> storm will come, right? So there are some things that are common. Some people know how to use the things that they have around them and things that happen to them. Some people blame the things that happen to them and therefore <clears throat> they because they consider they can they think along those lines of blaming they actually don't know what to do right so that's a big challenge with a lot of people who um who remain in that setting of the poor <clears throat> They don't know what to do with the things that happen around them or the things that happen to them. Like, for example, if there's a storm, what to do about the storm? If I lose my house, what to do about the loss of the house? So different things, right, are happening to the people. So what we want is to get people to understand that everyone have access to freedoms and resources like everyone else. Now, some people could blame others based upon things that happen to them. But the thing about it is that if you look at a lot of the wealthy people around the world, if you actually check their stories, a lot of them stories come from poverty. But they have to start thinking or believing something 
starting some new habits while they are poor in order to move to the other. So wherever you are now is because of a result of how you, what you believe <clears throat> and the habits you practice over the last five to 10 years, okay? So if you wanna change your results for the next five to 10 years, you have to believe some things differently and you have to do some different habits, okay? Because as I said, where you're presently at financially is because there are some things that you have believed over the last five to 10 years and there are some habits you have practiced over the last five to 10 years that have led you to where you are now. So in order to change that result for the next five to 10 years, you have to change your beliefs, you have to change your habits. And maybe to change your beliefs, sometimes you have to change what you know. You might know some things that might not necessarily be true for you or might not be in line where you want to go. All right? So let's find out. Also, we want to learn about subtle differences between different ways in which money moves or resources moves. All right? <clears throat> some terms that they use, for example, like assets and liabilities and investments and things. What do these things mean when it comes to resources? Not just money only, but resources, all right? What is a resource? How can I use the resource? How can I do something what is called resourcefulness in what I have? This is a characteristic you develop. Um, when one definition of resourcefulness is um, making use of what others have discarded or overlooked. <laughs> So imagine that. That's a it's a it's a definition that's used by Character First International. Making use of things which others have discarded means like waste or overlooked. A good example is um <coughs> I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the island in Bahamas called Paradise Island. Paradise Island used to be the country's dump. That's the dump for the Bahamas. They used to take all the dump, all the garbage and dump it on that island. That's how it used to live, right? As a matter of fact, another name they used to call it was Hog Island because a lot of pigs used to roam on that island, right? Eating scraps. Somebody saw the value in the island and turned that island into a resort. Well, they bought it because it was cheap. <laughs> it was a dump. Of course, what are you gonna do with a dump? But resourcefulness, thinking of resourcefulness is taking advantage of something that others have overlooked or discarded. In other words, they see nothing in it and you see value in it, all right? So we want to learn how to do those things. Also, you want to learn the difference, all right, between these things, all right? The income and expenses of different groups of people, the working class people or the people who are in the economic system. These people are employees, or they're self-employed, or they're business owners, or they're investors. They fall into these categories. But the income, the way they get their income, or the way they generate their income is different. The way they deal with their expenses, or the way they spend things or money is different. And we'll learn the differences. And as I said before, in order to move from one category to the next, you have to start functioning, or believing, or starting some habits of the next category before you can move to that category, all right? You have to start it before you reach there. Okay, how do we help? We wanna learn how to avoid the harmful effects of inflation and recession. Instead, we wanna learn how to benefit from inflation and recession, okay? We wanna learn how to manage our money after crisis. For example, there's a crisis going on now. What do we do now that will set us up to be better off after the crisis. As a matter of fact, what changes can we make now so it will set us up to take advantage of the present crisis and the aftermath? We'll learn about that. How to not, right, only survive, but thrive during, which is even now, during the crisis. You don't want to just survive, you want to thrive. Resourcefulness and innovation, right? We want to talk about you know, resourceful ways and innovative ways to get out of debt. Right? Bypass debt, waste capital, and even deal with investments, right? Attracting investments. We have very resourceful and innovative ways. And that's what um, groups like mastermind groups do. Right? Presently, I'm part of a mastermind group, an investment group. There are five of us. 
and we talk, sit down and we discuss innovative ways of investments. And that's something that people need to learn how to do, even at any level. All right? Okay, want to learn the difference between good debt and bad debt. How do we change from bad debt to good debt? How do we make that change? Not all debt is bad. Not all debt you need to get away from. But if you have, if you're only living on debt, you are actually living in a trap. As a matter of fact, it is even better to get out of all debt. But if you could use other people's money, as they say, and other people's time and other people's resources to get results, why not? That's what good debt is about, right? Is using other people's resources to elevate what you want to do, get what you want to do. And it becomes a win-win situation because they get results out of it too, all right? So those are things that we want to learn. Okay, so let's go on into the knowledge and beliefs. Now, poor people look at cash as valuable. So they know they are rich when they have plenty cash in hand, cash. So if they go into the bank and they swipe a card and or they give some a figure on a paper that says you have a hundred thousand dollars, they believe that they are rich because they have cash. The middle class also believe the same thing, but the middle class also believes they are rich or they are wealthy when they have cash and things. So if they have a better house, a nicer house, a better car, a nicer car. If they get up to go to a better vacation or nicer vacation, they feel wealthy, they feel rich because they have these things or they have things like bikes, and, um, boats, and, um, and jet skis, and you know, all these different things that they can enjoy. So, the middle class and the poor look at enjoyment of things or enjoyment of cash, right especially when it comes to a good time, entertainment. They enjoy entertainment so much that the other classes feed them with entertainment. More movies, more vacation spots, more fun eating or dining places, you know? So because the information they have in their head is that I am rich or I am wealthy or I am good once I get to enjoy things. Right? That information leads to a belief that the more things I have, the wealthier I have, the richer I have, right? the more prestige I have, the more things I have, or the more cash I have in hand. Trouble is, as they run down more cash, the cash runs from them. <laughs> that's the challenge. <laughs> right? That's a big, big issue that's going on with the, with the, uh, the poor. And of course, some of the middle class. The more they believe that and they try to run down more cash, the cash actually runs from them. So what they do, the habit that they have because of this belief is that they seek to either trick or outsmart others to gain more cash. Or they seem to work harder, longer hours to get more cash. So they prefer to work 10 hours in the sun to get cash instead of working one hour in the cool to develop something else, right? So, because cash, I remember um, when um, Robert Kiyosaki said he, he and his um, friend, you know, their, his friend's father told them, you know, they think they, want, they, wanted to, they wanted to make money. So what they did, they started making money out of silver, actually making like a, a mold and boiling, um, oil and different tin and so forth to get hot and melt and then put it inside of little molds and actually make money physically and let it let it get hard and they will print like a one or five and different numbers on it so eventually the the friends that caught them was trying to what is it that you're doing so you want to be rich so we're making money so he laughed when he looked at the effort they were trying to make cash so he said he said <laughs> He said, well, okay, if you want to make money, I can show you all. You'll come and visit me so and so time at my place. And if you want to make money, and I'll show you all. And he, they went, they went to visit him and he said, he told him, he said, if you want to make money, you have to learn how to work, how to, how to stop working for money. He said, really? That's what you have to do. He said, yes, you have to learn how to work, not for money at all. 
to learn without without getting money. He said, well, said, well okay. So well, they agreed. I said, okay, um, I'm into that. We really want that. So, okay. So he had them doing work, send them to um, his assistant to do some work. And they were working. And of course, at the end of the week, end of the different week, they're not getting paid. Even sometime eventually, they're seeing that the assistants and different people getting paid and they're not getting paid. So they went and complained, saying, yo, yo, wicked, how come you could do that? We could take advantage of this, us, we are little boys, and you're working us hard and you're not paying us. So he said, but I told you all to say you want to get rich. He said, yes, we want to get rich, and you're not paying us. So well, in order to get rich, you have to learn how to not work for money. So these people I pay, they're not going to get rich because they are working for money. They will never get rich because they will give me. So he said, what? What kind of things? So eventually, they start out to learn the lesson. <laughs> How to not work for money. But on the other line, which is having money work for them. So the habit of the poor and the middle class is that they work in order to get more cash. The rich and the wealthy, let's go to their knowledge now. They know something. They know that real wealth or real riches is not cash, but something that gives them cash, that works and brings cash to them. All right? So that's what they know. They know if they work to get this thing, this machinery, to generate the cash for them, then they have something that's rich or something that makes them wealthy. They know that. So what they believe, because of that belief system, they don't run down cash. They run down things that create cash or generate cash for them because they have this belief system. So they don't mind paying people plenty of money to work for them because they know it's not the cash is the aim, it's the system of operation is the aim. Now, that system of operation could be active or passive, meaning they could actually be working the system, in other words, they're doing something for the system to work, or it can be, that, that's, that's active, or it can be passive where they put money in a system, they have nothing to do with it, their hands off, and the system works for itself, which is called an investment. It works without their control, and it gives them back returns of investment, or ROI. Because of that, their habit is always looking for items that will generate more income, looking for opportunities. So they're reading, they're studying, their ideas, the things that they discuss are always opportunities, um, investment strategies, what can we move from here to there? They're looking for ways and means. Of course, what they will do also is engage the law, like the bankers, the lawyers, they will ask questions because they're trying to find out what can I do and what does the law say that I can do and I can't do? And what can I do to avoid some of the challenges that the law might give me? You know, sometimes they look for loopholes, right? <laughs> That's part of the game. But really and truly, to them, generating income is a game to them. So they're looking for ways and means how to generate, how to get another system. As a matter of fact, it is said that most rich, most millionaires have two to three systems that are working for them. Billionaires have seven and up items or systems that are working for them because they're always looking for systems that will work for them. That's their reading, that's their studying, that's their discussions, that's their, 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 their entertainment. When they go to a bar to lime or they go to a whatever to get together, they get together with friends to discuss strategy. Their fun is ideas. Ideas about solving problems. Ideas about coming up with other ideas, other opportunities, other strategies. That's a discussion. Now, the difference between the wealthy and the rich, so to speak, is when is that the rich look for things that generate wealth or, in, or cash flow or income for them. The wealthy try to look for systems that generate wealth increase or investment returns for a group of people including them so they're not just concerned about them or their family they're concerned about a neighborhood or a class of people in a particular challenge or a group of people experience a particular difficulty 
So they're always looking out for challenges that are taking place, finding out, okay, how can I create a business opportunity that helps the people but grows my, uh, my investment? And then they look for <clears throat> areas now to donate, which is separately. All right? One of the big, uh, two big persons who do these do things a lot are like um, Sir Richard Branson and um, Tony Robbins. They're always looking for opportunities to solve actual problems that people are having, whether it's water problem around the world. So they try to get well dug, they're trying to mobile connection or something like that, uh, environmental issues, you know, all those things. They're always looking for ways and means to find out what can I invest in to solve the problem. But also they're looking also for what can I donate to to solve another problem. So they, and but what they do, they keep their donations or their philanthropic um, operations separate from the investments. They don't mix it. That's one of the things they do, right? To, to, because they like that, they like that clear demarcation. This is an investment for returns, whereas the other one is a donation for no. The only return is the people get results. They get a cleaner water, or they get a better environment, or whatever it is. So they have these different things. So they're always searching, reading, looking, setting up meetings, connecting, you know? What can we do to help them? So they have these habits, daily habits that they do. Their meditation is on these things. They're thinking and their books and they read on these things. So they don't spend a lot of time watching movies. <laughs> they don't have the time. So it's, it's those kind of things that happen, right? So they can master and run the resources. In order to move from one to the next, one person in one class have to learn the habits of the other and the belief system and practice them. Then after a while, they start getting the results and then they move to that level. So you don't, you don't wait until they reach that level in order to get the results. You have to first practice it, right, before. You have to first practice it before you could get the results, all right? So Robert Kiyosaki put it like this. Employees have a job. So they go to work for someone. Self-employed own a job. In other words, you, you work for yourself. If you don't show up, you don't get any money or no resources. You get no resources, sorry. So the resources are only available when you show up to work for yourself. Okay? Now, this side of the spectrum, which is on your left-hand side, they work for resources, all right? The, the, the right-hand side of the spectrum, resources work for them. Now, resources could be time, work for them. So they, their, category, their um, thinking of time is not equal to money. They are able to actually create a system that generates whether it's one um, one level of income or 10 level of income or 1,000 level of income in the same time, right? Because they own what they call systems of operation. And those systems could be business systems, and it could be um, philanthropic systems, it could be corporate systems, it could be governmental systems. There are so many different systems you could actually design and develop and create. And one of the things that we do in um, the Innovative Program is show people how to take your skill and turn it into a system. So if your skill is baking bread, okay, how do I take this skill or this gift of baking bread into a system called a bakery? Where I am absent, but my input <clears throat> is extremely vital, and I could actually just look at the template every day and know what's happening in my system. That's how you develop it. And then, of course, you have the investor. All the investor does is put resources into the system. The resources could be land. I'm giving you land to work, or I'm giving you cash to work, or I'm giving you this building to work. This is my investment, and I want this return. Right? That's all the investor does. He's not actively in, in, involved. He's passively involved. Right? Whereas the business owner is actively involved in the system. So those are the four financial categories. This side, as I say, the right-hand side, systems and resources work for them, money and all of this is work for them. On the left-hand side, people there work 
for money. So in the left hand side, time is money. On the right hand side, money has nothing to do with time. It has to do with how big the system is, how efficient the system is, right? And we show you different systems. Here is the other part. The freedom to choose the lifestyle you want is based upon how you use these things. Your relationships, your time, and the things that you have. So your relationships have to do with family, friends, um, acquaintances. It could be people who you're just aware of. Or it could be relationships with coaches, mentors, teachers. How you use this relationship or how you leverage, which is a better word, these relationships will actually move you from one level to the next or keep you at the level that you are at. You have to decide. Okay? The more you collaborate with people, the more results you get. For example, one relationship that we teach in, in our, our business is the idea of turning a competitor into a collaborator. So that relationship, when you say, well, this person is in the same field as me or is in the same line as me, the normal thing for the poor person or the middle class person is to look at that person as a competitor. Whereas the rich and wealthy look at that person as a collaborator and they form what you call venture, right? Joint ventures, right? Or JVs. They form joint ventures to collaborate with each other to expand and grow larger organizations, right? So those are things that happen in relationships. Now, time, of course, everybody has 24 hours. As I said before, the poor and the middle class use their time to work for things or just to have fun because the other groups know that they want to be relieved of the stress. <laughs> so they find ways and means to give them a better restaurant to dine, a better entertainment system, more movies, you know, all those other things. Time is valuable. The rich and the wealthy, they control their time. They decide what time they wake up what time they work, what time they read or consume or produce, they manage and rule their time every day. Their time doesn't rule them, okay? The only, dip, the only thing that throws them off or might be a challenge is when there's an emergency. And the thing about it, they have contingencies even for that, all right? So time is money for one set because the money depends on the time or the resources depend on their time the amount of hours they put in the hour the others they leverage their time and here's how they do they do something called what they call productivity systems and in one of my courses i have something called productivity systems that's the last part of the innovative program which is showing you uh, how to have something called a four hour work week um if you want more information on that you just go to amazon and type in the four hour work week. There's a whole book on it. As a matter of fact, there's a whole website on it called the four hour work week, right? Where you have parents with two, three children, single parents, both parents, parents who are, some who are working on their corporate job, but they set up arrangements. So the book, the old program and the book shows you how to do that. Different class of people, right? Showing you how to use different things. Then you have also um, things. Things include um, house, building, yard, uh, vehicle. How do you use the vehicle? What do you use the vehicle for? Or computer, do you, you have a computer? Or you might have instruments, or you might have gifts and talents in different areas. How do you use them? Different people use them differently. Some people use it just for fun, and some people use it to generate income. It's up to how you use the things. And that's where innovation comes in. Innovation helps you to use things to be resourceful with the things that you have. So it shows you how you can take what might look little or negligent and show you how to take out the value out of it. All right? So that is very crucial when it comes to developing. Now, we want to deal with equality now. The quality of your lifestyle now, just as the lifestyle you choose, but 
there are people who are rich, but really, really um, degraded in lifestyle because they don't know how to manage their riches. So what happens is that the riches eventually consume them, controls them. So you have to learn how to be, how to look at these, um, the, the, the income or the different resources with a level of quality and qualify them in different areas. So what do you tell me tell people, learn how the difference between these things. For example, what is a donation? Why are you gonna donate to something? How to donate, all right? And then, of course, what is an asset? Which a lot of the which and the wealthy knows. What is a liability? They know a lot of these things. Investments. <clears throat> a lot of the poor don't understand what is an investment. The value of investment, or even the value of saving. They don't know how to. They don't know the value of it. And that's the difference. So, because they feel as if, if they put money to save, they will be without something, and that thing is more important than the future or than the um, than the asset. So they don't know the difference or they don't feel the value of the asset and, and savings and investment over expenses. Because expenses is an immediate need. It's like functioning with um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The physical needs, as according to Maslow, is, most, is, is number one. Once that is provided, then we can deal with the rest. Now, um, my persuasion from the greatest teacher ever lived called Jesus Christ. His persuasion is if you deal with the first, if you deal with the first need, which is purpose, <laughs> you see all the others are added, are added. He look at it like that. If I deal with purpose, if I deal with who I am and what I'm supposed to be doing, and I function at that level, all the assets, all the savings, all the invest, everything else is added. Is even the things that need to be my basic needs. And that's a belief system that helps you to separate these. Once you don't, once you have the challenge separating these different things, you'll always end up buying liabilities because it's an emotional thing. You'll always end up spending all that you have. So it's an emotional decision that actually keeps us poor. In order to move from the poor to rich or to a freedom state, we have to make a conscious mental decision. It has to get to a place where the mentality eventually tell the emotions, no. <laughs> and the emotions eventually have to agree, no. <laughs> it has to come at that level so we can separate these, all right? Because expenses is a big thing. Benefiting from inflation and recession. When people, when people start understanding the difference between assets, liabilities, donations, expenses, when you start understanding these differences, you realize that when things happen, like when um, <clears throat> oil increase, which was supposed to happen this year, and of course it's going to happen, um, when oil prices increase, you're prepared for it because your budget reflects this difference. If your budget will reflect the difference, you wouldn't understand or wouldn't be prepared for inflation or recession, all right? So inflation is when you have this great amount, this, this increase going on in prices and commodities going on. It's just around the world and you have no control over it. The prices are the same thing. You don't know how in the world these things are at this price. But here was happening. Of course, a lot of this has to do with Something is scarce in the market, so the price goes up. And all of those are true. But if you prepare yourself using a proper budget, you actually have control over what you buy and what you don't. You actually could refuse things. As a matter of fact, one of the things that governments have been trying to get people to understand is that they actually have control over prices. In other words, if milk goes up um, by, say, 200%, Everybody who buy milk have a decision to make that I am not buying that milk at that price. Let it stay on the shelf. Eventually, we'll have to drop the price, right? It doesn't matter what the people do. Everybody has to make that decision. <clears throat> so when you implement that budget system, your budget must have these four things. And there are other things that you could add, but it must have these four. If you want to move from poor to rich, 
or poverty to freedom. You must have these four. All right? You learn also how to implement a diversified investment plan. And that's what we're going to deal with just now. The different kind of investment plans you should have. You must be able to prepare to, well, you must prepare to buy when prices are cheap. But that comes from putting system, put systematizing your budget to look like this. You must be able to prepare or prepare yourself to sell when prices are high. You must get a financial coach or accountant. Very important. I am not a financial coach. I'm just giving advice. <laughs> I can I can direct you to one, right? I can answer some questions because I've been through uh, 10, about 11 coaches now for the last 10, 12 years, right? Learning from them, learning the best, getting their videos, seeing them interview the billionaires, getting answers from the billionaires, showing the difference between what's happening with them and what's happening with the poor people and why. So I've been privy to that kind of information. But I'm not a financial coach. <laughs> I can only give you information I've gathered. And I can show you some of the interviews, which I do in my, in my course. Right? You want to be flexible to move your resources as the time changes. One of the things I try to tell a lot of people, don't get married or make any commitment to any financial institution. Always, every year, every January morning, one of the things I do after, because I usually set my goals by the end of December, I set my goals for the next year. Go through my prayer and fast, um, seek guidance, all of that. January morning, by, by the end of January, I have connected with all the banks and asked questions. What are, what are the new investments they have? What are the different interest rates? What, how their investment funds going? And the different investments. I always, you know why? I'm looking to see what's growing and what's not. And you know what happened? Based upon the answers, I move my money. I move different things around. <laughs> because they're not, in, they're not in control of my resources. I am. <laughs> I am responsible for it. So I have to call. And that information is free. It is yours to get. As a matter of fact, they want to give you the information. They give you a set of appointments. <laughs> Sit down, ask questions, give them scenarios, go to the next one. Right? So I could you move your resources. And when things are changing, you move your resources to what's best for you because they're not concerned about you. You have to look out for you. All right? Very, very important. Okay? Okay. Replacing bad debt with good debt. I know this was a big one last time. I'm just touching it again. Replacing good debt with bad debt. First, replacing credit card with debit cards. Sell liabilities. If it is not giving you cash flow and you are in a jam with big debt, Start selling all the things that are not bringing you in resources except what you have to use now. Getting find a way to a garage sale, whatever, right? Consolidation, all of that. Loan consolidation. That's one of the things I said was to approach institutions, as much of them as possible, consolidate. Look for investment opportunities. Now, here's a big one with investment opportunities. You gotta be careful. Try one of the things that people can try to do is try to spread themselves too thin, right? By doing too much. So you want to cut down on that. You don't want to kill yourself <laughs> trying to get out of debt. Okay, you want to be smart. All right. So we're going to show you how to use investment opportunities the smart way. Okay, investment opportunities. Now, for example, we have investment opportunities that definitely will help us. <clears throat> And these are opportunities that definitely, <clears throat> if you use them, they will actually help you to bypass a lot of the things that are happening in our, in our world right now. You will be able to strive with what you have right now. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you a list of them. I'm going to show you how they can um, actually help you to get things done, right? So you have investment opportunities. Um, so the investment opportunities are things like business startups. When I say business startups, I'm not talking about big things. For example, you have somebody who wants to plant a plot of land and they're a neighbor. You can invest in that. You can say, what do you want to do with this land? Right? And they tell you they want to plant so and so. Okay, so you ask them questions. Who are you going to sell to? What arrangement do you have? 
you might even be able to help them in that area. You know? You know, I like what you're doing. I would like to invest in what you're doing. <clears throat> what, do you, what do you think you need? Let's sit down and work this out together. And sit down and build a plan, it's a piece of land. You might have somebody who wants to start a car wash. So, what do the person need? They might need bucket, they might need pools, they might need... Okay, how if I invest in your, your car wash system on the side of the road, and we gradually invest and grow this money, we may put a plan together. Sometimes little things like that, right? Then you have, so little, little startup, bakery. The person want to bake some things, but they need a proper oven. Hey, no problem, let's put together and I'll invest in your, in your, in your bakery. Let's see, let's, let's start with the little oven you have. Let's start and bake the little things. Let's give it out to different people and find out if they, if they like it, right? So we know we have a clientele. You know, send it to different offices, whatever. Let's, let's start with that. Then once we get orders, hey, we have plenty of orders now. We need to get a stove or oven. We need to go a bigger oven. Let's go together, invest. We make out a contract. We invest, we buy an oven. And you bake, the person's baking. All you did was invest. So you have little things that people can do to invest, right? Business startups. Right now, um, I'm investing in a, in a farm. I have a partner of mine um, next door. He's doing some gardening, invested in that, right? And some other investments that I'm doing right now with some other people. So it, it's, that's the kind of thing, right? Um, somebody's doing different workshops. I'm investing in that, work, those workshops, all right? That's the kind of things that are happening. Friends and group investment, which is what we call the whole thing of cooperatives. You know, cooperatives, where, where they got that from, is people coming together and they're pooling their money and say, hey, we in this group or in this village or in this street, Let's pull together and we're going to do this, we're going to do that, put up a plan together and, and get something going, right? Cooperative starts like that. Um, some people, you know, in our, our, our country, we call it Susu. I don't know if it's so, that's called that, like in all the other countries, <laughs> right? But Susu is something we have that way of grouping money. But the thing about it is that you might have what's one level. As a matter of fact, there's a Susu app right now. I don't know how, how far it has gone, but I remember these group, these guys had a Susu app where you don't have to actually work with cash, but you can actually do transfer using the um using the um the app, transfer money from your bank account to another bank account, things like that. Really, really good stuff. So these are group investments, right? And then forex, we deal with forex investment, index fund, right? Investment stocks and then penny stocks, uh, cryptocurrency. All these are investment opportunities, right? So startups, invest, important things a startup is research and plan. All you, so normally when you have a business startup and you go to the bank, you have a business plan and they will ask you all kinds of questions because you have to research, hey, you could do the same thing, just you and somebody next door. You don't have to go to the bank. I bring $200, you have this thing, and this thing might be, might be, um, with the $500, okay, you need $300, I will find you $300 and help you, um, you know, and we, we, we do it together. So, but we do the research together. I will ask questions. Who are you selling to? Who are the people going to come? How are we going to do this? Da, da, da. You ask questions and you plan together. Sit down and plan together. Make arrangement together. Work out a little contract, a little agreement together. People you know, right? So those are things that can happen. Research and plan. Group investment, as I said before, of course, it's a cooperative, um, right? Penny stocks. Now, penny stocks is really <clears throat> what they call very low cost stocks or pieces of companies, which you can do like uh, 50 US, 10 US, that sort of thing, right? Um, there's a guy who's a master of this. If you go to Google, just type in, um, um, just type in, uh, what's his name? Timothy Sykes. Right, Timothy Sykes is a master at penny stocks. You actually have a lot of information where you can actually start with low cash, right? But the thing about penny stocks is that penny stocks are individual stocks. So it takes a little work. That's it, not a little work, it takes a lot of work, right? It takes a lot. If you have time, yes. Now, apart from penny stocks and these advantages in you know, low price, increasing investment options, high potential rewards, right? Of course, the advantage is new companies with no history. So they look at low companies and they do research on them, right? Lack of liquidity. So the, the companies will have a lot of money. 
hard to take an, an informed decision. It's hard because you don't have a lot of information about the companies because they're small. So they have small prices. That's why they're so low. But they've created multi-millionaires, especially Timothy, have helped people come from poverty to multi-millionaires using honey stocks. So you can do it. Learn from the best. Um, Timothy, of course, have a, have a coaching program. Coaching program is expensive, like 6900 for the coaching program. But the 6900 is to be learned from him directly for a year, a whole year. And of course, you have to have, I think is, uh, how much is it, boy? I think it's about 2000 US in, to invest for the year. And about 10 to 15 hours for the, per, per week to invest. All right, so 10 to 15 hours is what you need from Timothy or to, for, to, to enroll in Timothy's um, program. All right, so it's very good, but you could choose to use his program, his, his oh, sorry, his paid program, or you could use to use his free program. All right. So you could choose, up to you. All right, so let me go on. Um, index fund. Now, index fund, here's the difference. Index fund is stocks, but here's the difference. It is stocks that, is, that are grouped in a fund where it's the best companies around the world. They group these companies in one fund, and when you invest in that, your money grows with these best companies. Right? That's an index fund. Um, different countries have index funds. As a matter of fact, the billionaires, what they do, and that's something they have revealed to, to my coaches and, and, and all of us, is that they put 70 to 75% of their resources in index funds. The rest is in individual funds, individual companies. But the index fund, they put 70 to 75% of their resources there because they know that index fund will always, always win. <laughs> it doesn't matter what happens, right? But they don't just put all in there because they have other things that could come and um, sometimes pass the index fund at some times and come back down and all of that. So they gain some money there too, right? But that's something that they've revealed that they do all the time, right? index fund. So, for example, FCB has an index fund system. You can actually go to on in the FCB website and you can check the index fund and you can invest in the index fund because they pool all the different companies in a particular group. So you invest, but investment, I think, is high. I don't think you can start with 50 US and kind of stuff, and 100 US, like the penny stocks, right? It's high. I uh, can't remember the exact figure right now, but it, it's, it's like 1,000 or 5,000 US or something like that to start, right? But it's lucrative, very, very lucrative, um, <clears throat> right? Forex, of course, investment, big thing. Um, we're presently developing an, investment, developing an investment company that's gonna have all these different options, but we're starting off with Forex and the other one I'm gonna to mention to you. Of course, most people should know what Forex is, right? Trading one currency for the next. Um, if you have any challenges understanding how this works, just let me know. But basically that is happening all the time. And um, the system that we're setting up is we're using um, traders who we can vet in terms of with their credibility, with their, um, their, um, their integrity and the way of doing things, making sure that they are able to stay clear of the three major, um, the three major giants <laughs> of the um, Forex world, which is greed, fear, and um, overconfidence, <laughs> right? Once, we, once they pass those tests, then we vet them and say, okay, this is somebody who we can recommend to our group, right? Those kind of things. All right, so, <clears throat> okay. Next, cryptocurrency. Um, this is a big one. Uh, the only cryptocurrency that we're looking to invest in now and we've started is Bitcoin. And the others are good, but you, if you don't understand the cryptocurrency, there you can go to YouTube. YouTube actually have better explanations, and just type in how cryptocurrency work. 
or how blockchain technology works. Really and truly, a simple version for those who might bear with me. <laughs> it's really um, it's really about what you call digital information or digital record. That's really what cryptocurrency is about. For example, when you swipe your card there is a set of information sent to your bank telling, telling the bank that you are using your card. That set of information is a chain, right? A chain of data. Another thing is that when you buy something online on Amazon or on eBay or whatever it is, the actual purchase, cash does not get transferred. What gets transferred is just a chain of information saying, this is the value of this item. This is the value on your, this is the amount of resources on your card that you're using. And once they match both and they see that what you have is more than what they need, then they can deduct the amount they need to pay for the item. That information is a block or chain of data. That is blockchain. So blockchain technology, is used now to create what you call secure chain records or secure records. The records are so secure, <laughs> you can't break it, right? Whereas with other currency systems, you can, you can, do, you can corrupt it, you can fraud, you can fraud, you can do all kinds of stuff. With cryptocurrency, you can't do it, that's the thing. <laughs> that's why it's so lucrative, <clears throat> right? With blockchain technology, the reason why it's not managed by governments can't manipulate it. But also, it is public, one, but second, but what is nice is that it's so secure that even if you try to change it on your side, it, and it doesn't match up with everybody else, it becomes error. <laughs> so it's so, that's what makes it so secure, that one person can't make a change and it change everybody. It, it, it can't work. So it, it, a lot of people are using it. Um, so, and of course, the price of a Bitcoin now, or the value, I should say, of a Bitcoin. So if you own one Bitcoin, the price now is 7,000 7, something. I'm trying to remember the exact figure, but it's some ridiculous figure, right? Um, that, that, that's value. So when you convert it, the cash flow, when you convert it, when you sell it, it's, it's like plenty of money, right? <laughs> let, me, let me just get back the, um, let me just get back the figure. Uh, right, if you're looking at it in TT dollars, the cost for one Bitcoin is worth 59,950 TT dollars, one Bitcoin. So if you buy um, two Bitcoins, and it start increasing. That's that's what happens. Um, but you could also buy bitcoins, not just in one. You can buy in value. So you can see, I buy fifty dollars worth, fifty US worth of bitcoin. Fifty US worth. That worth can increase, and we have different um, investment options that actually doing that. We can start with fifty dollars, investing in cryptocurrency or bitcoin as the as the first one. And it grows by hundreds of percentage, right? And those are lucrative right now. Um, and the thing about it that now there are secure agencies now that actually protect the transactions. So you can't fraud it and that's another thing. And of course, the Bitcoin is the most secure because it's protected by the biggest agencies, you know, in terms of security, right? And more than that, it's the security protocol that is used, the same protocol that the banks use. Right, which is called, I think it's SHE-256 or something like that, right? So those are kind of, kind of systems that they use. So it's a big, big thing right now, all right? Um, so I will, what I will do before I go into um, Innovatech, which is just a closing, I will go back to investment. So any questions you have, just let me know and we will go through it. Just raise your hand and we'll go through any question you have. All right, guys. So thanks very much for listening.